This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very, very good afternoon to everybody on the Sunset Safari with us, especially the kids of Diamond Springs Elementary, Mary Kay Good Elementary in Massachusetts, and Rosemont Forest Elementary in Virginia Beach, Virginia. My name is James Hendry, and it is marvellous to have you all with us today. Kids, you can ask us any questions you would like to during the course of this school safari. The rest of you, please keep watching, and you can, of course, your questions will come through a little bit after the school drive. You also ask your teacher, and she will say, or he will send them through to us, and we'll do our very best to answer any questions that you might have. I've got Sebastian on camera with me. There is Sebastian, and we have got Ralph walking around on foot, and we've got in the other car, oh, Mr. David Gitamba, Gitu. It'll be very nice for you to meet him very shortly. Oh, they've gone. The animals have gone. There are a few more up ahead. Those are called wildebeest. Or gnus. There we go. Now this is quite a special herd of gnus, and it's quite a special herd because it has lasted so long. These gnus in this part of the world, and that part of the world of course is the Western Kruger National Park of South Africa, that's where we are, but these gnus are not very common in this part of the world, and in fact there were less than 20 or so in this particular area for a very long time. And so to see so many gnus in one place here is very special. And although a lot of people think that they're quite ugly, I think they're quite attractive. I think they're quite pretty. Don't you think so? Look at their special horns. They've got a kind of sad face, but that doesn't mean they're sad. Right, now somebody who sees a lot and lot of these when he's at home in Kenya is David Gatamba Gitu. Hello to all of you school children and a warm welcome to our sunset drive coming all the way from Kruger National Park in South Africa. My name is David and with me today is Craig. Very excited to have you on board. For the ones who have been with us before, please, very nice to have you back. For those who have never been with us, warm welcome and make sure you keep seeing us as many times as you can. Remember, we request you one favor to ask us a few questions when you can, a few thoughts, any comments from what you'll be doing, because we shall be sending some questions to you. Okay, very good. Like that question from Leslie, it's a very good question. As I keep moving, and I'll be telling you, does it snow in Africa? Well, in Africa, it doesn't snow, unless when it's very, very cold, Leslie, and the temperatures maybe go below zero. It can only be certain areas that are, you know, very high, in high elevation, that you would see snow. But in general, in Africa, it's a very warm continent. But there are certain areas during winter when it's very, very cold and temperatures go below zero, it could snow, all right? Especially these parts we are in South Africa. You go to Central Africa, East Africa, and further north, Snow has never been seen there. And any time, one time, some three years ago, snow was seen in a country called Kenya. It was news all over the world when it snowed in Kenya for only 10 minutes. Right. So that's a very good way to start, Leslie. And please keep asking us questions, depending on what you're showing you. And we'll also ask you questions later on. The animals will show you. The birds will show you, and all the beautiful trees we shall be showing you will be helping you to identify them. And then at the end of the session, we'll see how all of us will be doing. Sounds good? All right. I'm sure you saw a wildebeest and you're so excited. Let's find out what animal David will show you for the first time. And let's go first to James Henry. 
So we've left our wildebeests and we are now going off towards where we saw a leopard this morning. A leopard is a very special spotted African cat and with any luck we'll see the leopard. But maybe we won't and if we don't that's okay. We'll still see lots of other interesting things as we go along. There are lots of trees and birds and flowers and fascinating stories about Africa that we can all enjoy together. Remember to send us through your questions. It's always nice to have them. <laughs> Hello Jackson. Isn't it funny, yes, that wildebeest have got beards? Well, Jackson, the reason they've got beards is because they think it looks nice. Most of them like the beards on each other, even though we think it perhaps looks a little bit funny, but you'll find that it's basically because they like it. Uh, that sounds like a silly answer, but over time, because one wildebeest likes the beard on another wildebeest, what it means is that the wildebeests with the longest beards are the ones that have the most calves or the most youngsters and that's how the wildebeest's beard stays long. It doesn't really help them to have warmth, it doesn't really help them to be camouflaged or hide away from predators, but it just appeals or is attractive to members of the opposite sex in the wildebeests. It is a funny thing, isn't it? Now we're driving through a very thick area with lots of trees and it's always where there are lots of, where there's lots of water here that you will find beautiful flowers. Avra, Nevea and Cameron, I think that's all of your names. While we look at this very beautiful flower, it's a quite a rare flower for this time of the year because we're going into winter. It's called the Plumbago. There it is. Not going to pick it. You three want to know why it is or how many animals there are here on safari. Well, you know, this area that we're in, the Greater Kruger National Park, is absolutely enormous. So nobody really knows how many animals exactly there are here because some of them are difficult to count. For example, it's difficult to count the small antelope like Dyker or Stienbok. And part of this park extends into Zimbabwe, which is another country, and Mozambique, which is also another country. So it's almost impossible to tell how many animals there are in other countries. Very difficult for us to count them. And then in this particular area, well, animals come off and go on. So that's also very difficult to count. But there are thousands and thousands of animals, really lots and lots. And remember that I think your question is probably only referring to what we call mammals. So that's big things like, well, not always big things, but that's things like monkeys and the wildebeest we saw, impala, nyala, lions and leopards, that sort of thing. But remember, every insect, every reptile, like a lizard or a snake, or every amphibian, like a frog, or every fish, they're still animals as well. So in actual fact, there are probably millions of different kinds of animals that we find here. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the name of that question. Who asked that question? Wraith. Wraith, the grass is so long because... Oh, Grace. Grace, the... <laughs> The grass is so long because we don't mow it. You say, why don't we mow it? Well, this is called a wildlife area. It's called a wilderness area, which means that we try not to do too much management. We let nature grow as it wants to. So we don't try and mow the lawn or chop down the trees or plant flowers or make flower beds or anything like that. It's not a garden. It's a wilderness. And so we try not to interfere with the different plants and things. But that's a good question because in some places they do mow the grass so that the animals can have an open area to see in. But we don't do that here. There's the most beautiful bird. And that is called the lilac breasted roller. Try and say that. A lilac breasted roller. Lilac is a special color, a very nice sort of pinky purple color. And it's called a roller because when it flies and it's angry, 
It looks like an aeroplane doing acrobatics. So that is the lilac breasted roller. And he always likes to sit on the end of a tree like that and show everybody how beautiful he is. Now there are over 300 kinds of birds we find here, believe it or not. 300 different sorts of birds. Absolutely amazing. Now somebody who's being very brave today because I think he's going to look for lions and he's on foot is Ralph Kirsten. Park off South Africa, trying to look for some lions and leopards. And remember, I don't have the comfort of the vehicle. Now, my name is Ralph Kirsten, and my cameraman here today is Fergus. He's with us. He's a very important part of our team. And don't forget to send us your questions. But we're going to sort our problems out, and we'll send you to David uh, just in the meantime while we fix some things up here. Right in there, I have plans to get to a water hole that once in a while I have spotted some antelopes and maybe from a distance I can see some antelopes coming up and we'll try to compare the antelope that I'm seeing ahead of me with the big van beast or the wild beast that James showed you. Sometimes they're a bit skittish. We'll try and focus them from here. Could this be good, Craig? And then we'll try and go close to them. Let's see the first here antelopes that I got for you and then we'll try and get closer to them slowly slowly sometimes they get skittish for no reason or when they think we could be you know too big for them and we call those ones impalas impalas is the name of those antelopes you got on your screen there and I'm sure your teachers might have taught you when you've been learning about science that there's a difference of some antelopes in Africa where males will have horns and the females will not have horns. Okay, you notice almost all what you see there, they got horns, which means they are all boys. So because I've seen them from where we are now, I will try to reposition myself and go a little bit closer and give you a better view and hopefully they don't go away, right? Rose, you're asking how hot it can get here in South Africa. I would say the highest I remember recorded was almost 95 degrees Fahrenheit. 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was too hot. And many people complained, you know, how hot it was. And that was during summer. Rose, you could give me an idea what could have been the highest temperatures you ever had in your life at home and then let me know and we compare to my 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, we have come closer to these antelopes and I'm sure you'll see them better. And if I may turn Craig a little bit to the right, sorry Craig, there's one that's trying to fight with a small bush. Let's see whether you can see what he is doing with that bush there. Okay, look at that. And there's one that was trying to fight the bush. You blocked the tree there. It just stopped. But if you look carefully, do you see that one there? You see? He's either trying to bring the bush down, but he could be doing two things. He could be doing what we call a scent marking. Many antelopes will always have boundaries or territories or areas where they live. So what this big boy is doing here, he could be marking his area and making sure all the males around him know that this is his area. If you look at him carefully, look at the size of his horns. Compare the size of his horns with all the other boys there. Well done, Craig. You'll notice his horns are much bigger than the other like one, two, three, ten boys with him. That shows he is the big boy here. He's like what you'd call a prefect or a monitor. So he is in charge of all the other boys. 
So what he's trying to do is to say, this is my area, and then he's going to leave a smell of a kind or a scent on that bush. So if other males like him will come in this area, we'll know he owns it. That's exactly what he was doing. Sometimes they will do that when they want to sharpen their horns, because occasionally you'll see males will fight with each other for territory. Ethan, that's a very good question, and you're asking if antelopes fight. Yes, they do fight, and we see more fights among the males and not the females. And that's why, Ethan, most of the males, like what you see there, got horns, and they use those horns for fighting. And once in a while, they will fight for territory, as I was just saying, to make sure they defend or they protect their territory. Or sometimes they use the horns maybe to, def to defend themselves against predators or against animals that might come for them like lions or leopards. But in general, they use the horns to fight, Ethan. Is that beautiful, kids, to see some nice impalas just in the road for you? Curious, you're asking what hunts the antelopes. Animals that eat other animals are called predators. And some of the predators that could hunt this particular antelopes we have here are leopards. Leopards in this area we are of Kruger National Park are very known to hunt impalas for food. Other animals that could hunt these antelopes or other predators would be hyenas. We also see sometimes lions going for them and even other cats like the cheetahs. We also got other animals or other predators that also hunt the same antelopes that are called wild dogs. So there's so many animals that will hunt these animals here that we call the impalas. The antelopes you have there are the impalas, but also we got other interesting animals that hunt them, like snakes. We got a very huge snake in Africa called the python. We have seen pythons also hunting impalas. If it gets a male, for example, it will swallow the whole body and make sure the horns do not get into, into its body. So you've got so many animals that will come and hunt these impalas. Ruth, thank you very much, Ruth, for your feedback. And hot days in summer and August 90s, that's pretty high, and I hope you usually survive. And that's pretty close what we also do here and when we get to the temperature I was saying before everybody complains it is very hot my friend Raf is walking and would like to tell you something too now I'm sorry about that everybody we just had a little problem uh, with uh, some uh, machines but we fixed it up now my name is Ralph Pearson we're out on foot we're looking for lions and elephants this afternoon, so we need to be quite quiet as we walk through the bush, because you know what it's like. It's like if you had to go uh, in the areas where you find some grizzly bears, maybe, and you need to be very careful if you want to go and see them, especially if you're walking out without a vehicle, without a car, you need to be careful and quiet, because you want to spot the animal that he doesn't know that you are there. So we're going to be looking for elephants and lions today. And please send us your questions through your teacher and we'll do our best to answer all the questions that you have. But now, look at this. We can see that there's some signs of elephants here. Why? There's lots of poo around. This is old poo, but there's lots of fresh signs as well. And elephants like to be in this area where there's lots of shade, especially when it's nice and hot like it is today and when we were coming through here we did drive a little bit and then we came on foot now so we're going to continue and see if we can find some more signs of them in the meantime back to james james just ran over a big log and i thought i'd made maybe hurt the car or punctured a tire but we seem to be okay Phew. We haven't found anything else animal-wise yet, but you can still see 
that it's a beautiful day out here and we're driving towards where we had a leopard earlier this morning. I hope we'll get there on time. <laughs> Gavin, all animals in the world have to drink water. If, well, yes, in fact, most 99.9% .9 of animals in the world have to drink water. So yes, there is water here in South Africa for the animals to drink. Some animals can drink much less water than other animals. So we have animals here that can survive with very little water. And some animals that if they have to, they will get enough water from the food that they eat. And so they don't actually have to go and find water to drink. But there are very few animals that are like that. But you will find that we've got little water holes dotted around the place that the animals can go to and drink it, drink from. But we don't have big flowing rivers in this particular area. And in fact, in South Africa, it would be unusual to find a big flowing river like, say, I don't know, what rivers have you got near you? Uh, I don't know any big rivers in, in Virginia, but of course, great big American rivers like the Mississippi and that sort of thing, no, very unlikely that you'll find one anything like that size around here. And there are some in Africa, but not very many. <laughs> and there are some very dry parts of Africa that I suppose are quite like the dry parts of Arizona, for example, which you will find lots of animals in that are able to survive with almost no drinking at all and they can drink maybe once a week. And they also find water by digging under the ground for things like melons, which have a lot of water in them. Let's go this way. Let's see if we can't find a nice bird for you. Ooh, on the road there, we've got something interesting. I'm sure those of you who've been on safari before will know what that is. It's uh, that big pile of oh. dung there. That's elephant dung, everybody. We're just going to have a very quick look. It's about the size of a small soccer ball. Imagine making that much dung. Let's keep going, because I don't want to miss this leopard before you guys have to go to whatever your next lesson is. Let's keep driving along. And remember also that we're going into our winter time now. It's not summer anymore here, and so it's opposite from what it is where you are. Dimari leopards have spots for the same reason that soldiers have camouflage pants. It's so that they can hide in the bush without being seen by the things that they want to eat. It's, it helps them to hide away. And if you look in the shadows of a bush, whoops, Daisy, sorry about that, Sebastian, I missed that. If you look in the shadows of a bush, you can see that a leopard is very well colored. There's a special little animal that a leopard would like to eat. And that's called a stienbok. And his very clever strategy to avoid being eaten is to just lie very still. That's why his name is stienbok. It means stone buck. He's tiny, he's only about the size of, say, ooh, a small Labrador. Lily, yes, antelope are exactly like deer. Well, they're not exactly like deer, but they're very similar. We don't get deer in Africa, especially not in southern Africa. There was once a deer that lived in very northern parts of Africa, but not down here. They're very similar. The big difference is, of course, the deer lose their antlers every year and antelope have horns, which they do not lose. And I can't see if that one is a male or a female. Did you see, Seb? No, not yet. I think that's a female, so she does not have horns. She will never get horns, in the same way that a female deer doesn't get antlers. So most antelope females do not get horns. Oh, David has found a scavenging bird and its home.
No updates, I'm afraid. Um, do you mind if I go into Torchwood? I was just getting a quick update on the radio there. I'm sorry that we lost David. He's obviously got a problem with his car. There are many, many, many different things that can go wrong on these cars because it's very, very clever how we managed to get a video signal all the way to you, all the way across the sea. All right, Ralph is now walking around and let's hope that his system is working. Now, everyone, I'm sorry about all those problems that we had with the camera, but we seem to have fixed it up. Now, there's elephants all around us here. We can just hear them doing their little calls, which is very difficult to hear sometimes. They don't always trumpet like you see on TV. They do a very low... They're around us here, but the bush is very thick, so we need to be careful. But we're looking for lions, because we know that they were in this area earlier today. But we need to be very careful, as I said, because we don't want to scare them. And uh, we also want to just be nice and safe. Uh, but uh, it's very exciting, because there's lots of elephants around. They're much bigger than us, and we do need to respect them. It's almost like, like I said earlier, when we had our problems with the camera, it's like going looking for grizzly bears. You need to be a little bit careful if you want to get close to them. But the way that we want to do it is we want the lions not even to know that we're here. So we're going to be very careful, very quiet. And we're also just going to be listening, trying to hear if the lions are around. Now, Tamira, lions have manes because it protects their big neck. Because the males will have the big mane and they fight with other males. They fight over territories, so they fight with other, the other males and that protects their neck. And it also makes them look nice, doesn't it? So they're very big and those manes are for protection around the neck when they fight with each other. So there, there might be one or two males with these lions. We'll see if we can uh, catch up with them. I'm not promising you anything because they might have moved from this morning. Caden, there's not really any animals that hunt lions. The biggest uh, threat to lions is probably us as humans, and they know that. So when we're walking through the bush, they'll also get a little bit scared of us as well. And then they always fight with hyenas, don't they? So they need to be careful of the hyenas as well. If the little cubs are left alone, well, they can get killed by the hyenas, and sometimes they even eat them. We've just heard some elephants over that direction now. They're very far away, and I'm sure that you didn't hear it, but they're going... So there's, there's lots of elephants here. Wow. Okay, so we're going to move a little bit away from the elephants and try to get some more signs of these lions. But I think, I think it was David. He's got one of those uh, sinister birds. Right, my apologies there, uh, you lost me technically, and I'm very happy you're back with me. And we were talking about very huge birds of prey, or big birds that eat sometimes other birds, and what we have here are called vultures. Vultures, and I was giving you an example of this tin box James was showing you. Once we get the predators hunt tin box, for example, and then they move on and they leave a bit of bones and meat on on the ground, we got animals that will come and clean that mess. And such animals or such birds are what you have on your screen there, and this is called the white-backed vulture white backed vulture they are very big birds and we compare them here in the wilderness or in the bush like the garbage collectors you have back home that will always come say every saturday or once a week and collect all your trash and go and empty it somewhere you'd imagine the predators killing animals and eating and leaving it there the smell and the maggots and the worms, it could be such bad place to work in. And the whole, you know, game reserve would smell very badly. But now these birds will come and clean every mess left behind. And sometimes they are also helped by hyenas to do the same. 
So what they're doing there, they have a nest, and I'm sure maybe either they got some eggs or they have chicks up there. And they always look for very big trees that are very solid. So here you would like to know, do lions hunt birds? Yes, lions will hunt birds, not big like vultures, these are too big for them, but they'll hunt small birds. Say, for example, Franklins, that size of birds, yes, lions will hunt birds. Apart from the big animals they hunt, if they're very hungry and a bird, you know, just flies or gets close to them by mistake, they will go for it. Other birds that lions hunt are Ostriches, you can imagine a lion chasing an ostrich because lions or because ostriches got very huge drumsticks and they go for them. But that's not very, very normal. In general, they always hunt the antelopes that have four legs. But when those animals are not available and they're not near where they are and see an ostrich passes nearby, they'll give it a chase and get it as much as ostriches are much faster than lions. Yes, they do hunt birds once in a while. We'll move on and see whether we shall get you more animals. Right. So you come out here in the bush and you come with an open mind and you just keep looking up. We looked up, we saw the vultures. Sometimes you look down, you see an antelope. It could be anything. Niva, that's a very good question. And you're asking what is the realest animal on the safari to see? Well, there are a few, and most of these animals that are quite rare to see are the animals that come out at night. So for me, I'll give you two, which I think personally are very rare to see. And I'm talking about number one, pangolins, two, I'm also talking about adverks. Those animals are hard to see because they only come out at night and they're very, very shy to be seen. So if you're lucky, you'd see them. But for me, those two pangolins and the adverks are the most rare animal to see on a safari. Maybe you might see one today, Neva. Who knows? Could be a good day for us, eh? Just cross your fingers, eh? Because once in a while you bump into them, you know, just coming out and most of the pangolin. But the advac, it's almost impossible to see it during the day. It's very nocturnal and they live underground in the barrows. We'll keep looking for any animal we might see. And as I said earlier, okay, let's first very quickly go to Ruff and hear what he has for us. Well, everyone, we're still trying to find these lions. And what do we do when we want to find lions? We need to try and walk slowly, look for their tracks. We've had some tracks just near to us now, so we know that they've moved up in this direction. Now, I've just come on top of this termite mound just to see if I can see if the lions are lying in the grass here somewhere because the, the grass is very long and uh, if these lions are lying down we won't even see them in there so sometimes you just need to stop and listen and see if they're around and they maybe haven't moved too far we also need to be careful of the elephants so it's all very exciting but for now they're still in front of us and there's some other animals just moving through the bushes here. Some antelope, nyala, and daika. Um, and speaking of antelope, we're going to carry on. James has got a different one to show you. We've got a kudu. Now, this is the biggest antelope that we get out here. It's not the biggest antelope in Africa, but it is the biggest one we get out here. That's called a kudu. And that's a female kudu. You'll remember I was telling you about the Stienbok and the fact that only the males have got horns. Well, it's the same with kudu. Only the females have got horns. At least only the females don't have horns. The males have horns. So this is a group of females, and we call them cows. So unlike female deers, which are called does, we call these cows. Just like the ones that you get milk from. 
Well, Julian, if you watch very carefully, you'll be able to answer your own question. Let's see if this doesn't... Kudu doesn't answer your question for you. There you go. See? She's eating leaves. They're called browsers, which means they eat the leaves off trees. I think there's a big one coming through here. Let's see, I think a big male kudu. Let me just reverse a little bit. I just saw some movement in the bushes. There's something moving through there. You got him. Ooh. Jacob, you're obviously a child of the 21st century. Of course you are. You're only about five to seven years old. You say, how do we get phone signal out here? Well, Actually, it's not too bad, but sometimes we don't get phone signal out here and you have to survive. Can you believe it? Perish the thought without a cell phone. Can you imagine life without a cell phone? I bet you can't. But you know, even when I was growing up, and I'm not very old, I'm probably about the same age as your parents, actually. We grew up with no cell phones, no service. We had to write letters to people. Can you believe it? using the post, no email, no internet, but the kudus and the bush and the wonderful feelings that a place like this gave me as a child brought me out here and it can be the same for you despite the fact that of course we're growing up in completely different times. The wilderness stays the same. Well we try and make sure the wilderness stays the same. Now that's a male kudu with the horns, as you can see. Valentino, much as the leopard has got spots, so the kudu and the zebra have got stripes. Well, not so much the zebra, but certainly the kudu. That's to try and stay camouflaged and hidden away. It just helps look a little bit more like it's a smaller animal or a smaller thing or not actually a thing at all when a predator sees those white stripes in the thick bush. It's very difficult for us to understand that because our eyes don't work like predator eyes do and we don't see very well at night. But if a predator is hunting at night and it sees those stripes, sometimes it thinks, oh, I don't think I'm seeing anything that I can eat there. See how big his horns are? Beautiful horns. Well, Isabel, as I always like to say when I hear this question, it's just the same reason that the big bad wolf in the story of Little Red Riding Hood had so, or such big ears. It's so that they can hear well. And if you look carefully, as well, you can see the ears twitching from the back to the front and to the side. And they don't both have to twitch the same way at the same time. See, there we go. The right one moving independently from the left. And that just helps them to hear if there are any predators around. So if they can hear some rustling in the leaves on the ground or a breaking twig or perhaps the shuffling of fur against a bush then they'll be able to hear that so they've got very powerful ears they can hear much more than you can hear or than i can hear it's very clever and they've also got very good eyes they can see much better in the dark than you and i can Mm, Tiana and Donna Rose, most animals actually are colorblind to a certain extent. It doesn't mean they don't see any color at all, but they see limited color. The predators which see the best at night are the ones that see the least color. And in fact, dogs and cats can't see the color red. They can only see blues and greens and different combinations of blues and greens. So they're unable to see the color red. And that's why the little Steenbock we saw earlier is actually quite well hidden. He's a brownish, russety red colour. And that's quite difficult for the predators to see out here, especially if he's standing against a green background. Some animals that are not colourblind include many of the bird species, like that lilac-breasted roller would be pointless if he was so many beautiful colours and his Friends couldn't see he was such beautiful colours, so the birds, many birds, are not colour blind. But most of the mammals 
are to a greater or lesser extent colorblind. We see in superb color, obviously, and most mammals don't see color anything like as well as we do. But I think we should move on here. I'm just going to drive quickly close and see if we can't get to those le that leopard, which was not far from here. Nolan, uh, do some animals eat other animals from their own herd? Well, herd is normally the word we use to describe a herbivore, so animals that only eat grass and tree leaves. So, no, that doesn't happen. But in a hyena clan, sometimes the hyenas will eat a dead member of their own clan. Sometimes lions will eat a dead lion. And so sometimes it does happen, yes, but only amongst the carnivores. It doesn't really happen amongst the herbivores. Now it looks to me like this is where the leopard went. So we're just gonna see if we don't get very lucky. We don't really know where she is, but this is where she was this morning. And I know you've only got a few minutes left. So we'll just drive around in here and see if we don't get very lucky and spot a leopard. Leopards are very special. Lovely colors, they're very well hidden. And this particular leopard here has got a cub, a little baby. It would be very special to be able to show you them. Just trying to get down into this little drainage line area. Drainage line's a little river because apparently this leopard killed something and then she had half of it but then she hid the rest of it in one of these tall trees here somewhere. Hmm. All right, we're going to look around here. If I get lucky, I'll see you again. everyone we are in the vicinity of elephants and lions we haven't been able to uh, exactly locate the lions just yet they're in this block somewhere it's quite difficult for us because you see the the, the grass cover here um, it, it, it's it's quite difficult to track an animal in this so like I've been speaking about before there is um, a little bit where we need to think about where the animals might have moved but um, we just continue on going and zigzagging through this block just to see if we can catch up with the lions but there's elephants all around us in the thickets here so we need to be very careful very quiet and uh, there's a big worm crawling on your camera there <laughs> now Marissa oh let's let me just see I'm hoping that this it little might worm might make me a bit itchy uh, so I'm a little bit scared to grab it there's a big worm on the camera here, but it's a hairy caterpillar, so it might make you very itchy. Let me just see if I can get it off. There it is. Look at that. Big hairy caterpillar is what they're called. Let me see if I can put it on the stick. There we are. Now, this big hairy caterpillar will make a very beautiful butterfly, but what its defense is, those little hairs, they all have... Uh, it's almost like stingers on them, and they'll make you get a lot of blisters on your skin. But isn't he beautiful? Look at that. Wow, and look how he walks. With those legs moving forward. It's almost like a train. See, it looks like it's going from the back to the front, hey? And look at his hairy face. And a really strange-looking caterpillar, this. But I'm sure he's going to make a very beautiful butterfly probably one of the emperors or that is wonderful I've had lots of these um, give me blisters even if they walk over your clothes uh, sometimes and then you put your clothes on uh, and then you get the blisters from where they were walking so you need to be very careful with those fine little hairs look at him there and luckily I saw it on on the camera because it might have given Ferg some blisters as well and that's the defense it has, because little birds and things, they'll all want to eat it. But uh, with all these poisonous hairs, 
It uh, makes it uh, a good defense. Now, we're on the lookout for lions. We're going to go and try and find them. But my good friend James, he's found you a leopard. Look, we got so lucky, everybody. There's a female leopard standing in a tree. And she's almost impossible to see. You can see why she's got spots now. And we're going to try and get a little bit closer a bit later on. But for now, this is the best view we're going to get, I'm afraid. I know it's not the best view in the world, but in that tree, she's got some meat. She's got something to eat. And so I don't think she's going to go anywhere at all. I think she's going to stay there the whole afternoon. And so we might be very lucky to spend quite a lot of time with her. Which would be wonderful. There's her face, you can see. Isn't she precious? Now her name is Guchaba, which in the local language of Shitsonga means the one who is afraid. And that's because she is a little bit shy sometimes of the cars. She gets a little bit nervous around them. Carter leopards are so fast. Oh, she's going to come down the tree. Look at that. There we go. They're so fast because their prey is so fast. So if they were slow, she's calling her baby. She's calling her cub now. Did you see she was just going... If they weren't fast, Carter, they would never be able to find anything to eat. So they have to be very fast to catch their prey. I know this is not a very good view of a leopard, but she's in there, and we'll try and get a better view of her a bit later. All right, go ahead, kids. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day at school. And don't worry, you only have 12 or so years to go of school. I know that seems like a very long time, um, but it isn't really that long at the end of the day. Enjoy the rest of the day. We're going to stay right here with our leopard. Now, for you regular lot, hello and welcome again, of course. Please do talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live will use the chat stream on YouTube. Um, we need to try and get into a position where we can actually see these cats. If I drive down into the drainage, we will not have any signal. And so we need to probably make a decision as to whether or not we go around the drainage line and see if we don't get a better view from the other side, which I think is going to be difficult. Anyway, uh, we'll do that. Let's see what happens. And in the meantime, we'll link to David and see what he can show you. Righty, all good and uh, welcome for the regular viewers who just joined us. And here we are, just very close to the tree water hole and we want to find out if there could be anything happening here at the moment and exciting news with Kuchaba with a cub having been seen Kuchaba is one leopard I'm also looking forward to see at one point eh? I'm sure you must have had we started going to a new area this morning called the Torchwood and Taylor was very lucky on her maiden visit there she saw Kucha, she saw Kuchaba and the young one that was a very good start. Hopefully, I'll be next. Eh? So we're gonna explore this waterhole here and find out if there could be any life. The time is come here and get some buffaloes drinking, or some just beautiful lapwings having a drink, or the Egyptian geese, any water bird. All right, let's see if there's anybody home here at the moment. Not sure there's anyone, but beautiful reflection of the trees there. Oh, very good job, Craig. Not sure anybody could be thirsty now to come and have a drink. It's pretty warm. It could be some good moment for even predators or herbivores to come down and have a quick drink. 
but the water hole is entertaining us with all the reflection of the trees. And I think Kuchava is back in action. There is Guchava. She's back in action, everybody. This is my first meeting of this leopard, actually. Sitting down in, on the sand there, hoping that her little baby will come out. And I believe nobody's managed to sex the baby yet. So that'll be quite interesting, won't it? Now I'm looking at her and I believe that it's possible her father, Guchava's father that is, of course she's Tandi's daughter, but it's possible her father is Mvula, which is very interesting. Well, there's, the cub. there's the cub, there's the little one. Hello little one. Um, I missed the name of that query, I'm afraid, Kirsten, but no, the cub does not have a name. Ah, Magic Dragon Wizard, of course. How could I possibly have forgotten that name? Magic Dragon Wizard? No. The cub does not have a name yet. And um, I imagine if we start to see this little thing for more regularly, we will definitely you know, prevail upon people to allow us to give it a name. That's very fun indeed. Now, does anybody know how old this cub is? I seem to remember that she's about three months. Oh, look at that. I think that's a little female. 10th of January, so about five months. Fantastic, thank you for that, James Richard, who's the great authority on not only leopards, but butterflies, I discovered today, with his instantaneous identification of the Eastern Scarlet. I think that's a little female, from what I saw there. I know that that's a flash ID, everyone, but I'm going to go with it for now. Come on, come back. She's coming back. That's why Mum's looking at her. I know this, this isn't the best view in the world, but we can't get any closer and maintain a signal, I'm afraid. So we're just going to have to make do down here. I've got from Kirsten in the final control that we're getting lots of oohs and ahs and sweets and cutes. Uh, yes, who can but disagree with all the oohs and ahs and sweets and cutes that you're giving us? Hello, my dear. My name's James. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Sebastian on camera. Well, I wonder your mathematics is a bit better than mine. You said 10th of Jan is four months, is it? To the 10th of February to the 10th of... Yes, I suppose it would be. Yeah, yeah three and a half months. Here we go. Four months, sorry, yes. Now let's look carefully. Yeah, I'm going with female there. Alistair, you want to know Chava's spot per turn? It is three, a three. Sorry, I'm just turning down my vicious game drive radio. I'm going to have to call this in for Andrew. I'm not sure where he's driving from. And to those of you who are new viewers, there are lots of tourists driving around here on game drives from commercial lodges and we're all in contact on the radio. Stations have relocated Guchawa. At the moment, a one out of five visual. She is in the drainage system just off your 4 road.
Uh, more than that, I cannot really tell you about this leopard, other than the fact that she's this far north and seemingly very comfortable indicates to me that she really has taken over Tundi's old territory. This was Tundi's domain completely while Karula was alive. And so quite conveniently, Tundi has moved into Karula's territory and young Guchava has moved into Tundi's territory. And as we have started today on our Torchwood Traversing, we have got both of them as new characters. Isn't that wonderful? Ooh, might be wrong there. A little glimpse behind the tail. Oh, that's a magical shot. This, yes, there definitely could be. I don't think in the southern parts of Torchwood. I think in the southwest or southeast towards the Kruger boundary we'll have Inkanyeni. Uh, this side, uh, we know in Kanyeni from our times at Cheetah Plains, we'll have Guchava here and Tandi north of here. But I think that the northeastern corner and possibly the northwestern corner into Biffles Hook could give us a sighting of a female leopard and cubs that they do see from time to time on Biffles Hook but that we have never seen. Hello, little thing. What is your spot pattern? Yeah, I'd love to try and get to the other side so we can get closer, but the bank is so steep that it actually wouldn't help at all. So we'll just have to satisfy ourselves with this long distance view for now. We might try and get down there and see if we can't wangle some signal a bit later. <laughs> Caitlin, you heard me there saying on the radio that Andrew, there was a one out of five visual. Um, you say, how do I rate that? Well, I rate it by my ability to see it from here with the naked eye, basically. It's probably, one out of five is probably uh, not a great rating is probably more like a two or three but because she's so far away it will be very difficult for somebody without a very good pair of binoculars to see nicely get in on the cub there Seb the bottom no. yeah. now it's a one out of five mm. I'm going with female chaps until I can see two golden orbs, I'm going with little Missy. Now, much as I enjoy a male leopard on foot, because they are very inquisitive, well, not, not to say that Shungilia wasn't, and my ex-favorite leopard wasn't very inquisitive too, or certainly she was more tolerant. Ooh, Ooh. no, that's, oh, I'm still going with female. I might be wrong. Yeah. I'm very happy to, to be wrong. But I'd quite like it if, the, if she was female. Because it would mean that they would, she'd hang around, you know? This separation anxiety I'm getting from Hosanna's disappearance and Tumba's evacuation is really making me feel quite, uh, quite sore. I'm sure some of you would have got screenshots there. I think that was the best shot we had there. So any screenshots you have there of that brief glimpse we had, we can have a good view. Now, while we ponder on these things, Ralph Kirsten continues to track much bigger kitties. Now, 
everybody this is a little bit of a game of cat and mouse and uh, it's a little bit difficult uh, to find these lines as quickly as we would like because um, they were sleeping just behind me um, a little bit earlier today but the elephants have obviously moved into the area and we know what happens when elephants move near to lions well the lions normally get out of the way so we've literally moved up um, in an easterly direction we found some tracks up there they circled back and they came to where they lay down again um, and then it seems like these elephants have moved into the area and they've pushed these uh, lions up uh, in a, what is that that's a southerly direction so we're going to be now heading up that way we're checking the tracks as you can see lots of fresh elephant signs around we did hear them we we, we saw them a little bit earlier we also avoided them especially when you're out on foot um, they were sort of moving they weren't really feeding too much they were in a in a moving sort of uh, mood so we didn't uh, hang around with the elephants but what's also making it difficult is the elephants have now moved through behind the lions and I'm not sure if you can see here but a lot of elephant tracks uh, that have come through and flattened everything that would have been uh, helping us find the lions. So we're doing a little bit of intuitive tracking, um, and especially with Ephraim here, the game scout, he does know where the Unkohumas do like to move. So we're now heading up uh, in the direction where we do feel that they have moved. But it's all a little bit intuitive. Every now and then we do get a little bit of a sign that does confirm that uh, we're moving in the right direction. But we're also moving up now behind these elephants as well. So it's the lions, the elephants, and then us. So it's a little bit tricky. And as I say, lots of elephant signs, there's dung everywhere. It is a, a quite a large um, breeding herd that is split up and they're not all together as one group. So we do need to be careful because they're all over the place. So we're just going to continue trying our best, seeing if we can catch up with the Unkuhumas. And my game scout tells me that they do move very fast as well. So while we do that, let's head you back to the beautiful female leopard, Kuchaba. The female is now hiding, but we have the cub over there. Sebastian now convinced it's male. I'm still unconvinced either way now. I certainly saw the flash of gold from behind there. Anybody sent through some screenshots? I think that's, I mean, we've got a pretty good look there. We should be able to tell from that. And uh, I don't mean screenshots of its face, of course. While we do that, um, Seb, there's mm -hmm. a Kalenko succulent there with a butterfly on it. Um, that we can get our resident lepidopterist perhaps to to, to oh, identify yeah. for us uh, that right. yellow yeah. yellow flower. There you are. Yeah, okay. There we go. Come on, James Richard. You got you got. I think we should give him what 15 seconds. I think it should be enough. <laughs> Plus our delay. Looks like a fryer, but it's got too many colours on it, I think. Oh, it's flown off now. <laughs> we can, you got him again? Ah, well done. Could it be that we've stumped James Richard? I don't believe it. Not possible. I, I, I don't know this butterfly. I, I know I've seen it before, but I don't know what it is. Looks a little... No, it doesn't look like that, James. You were just hoping desperately. Anyway, we can go back to the leopards. See them there. Mm. Seems my eyes. Sebastian's struggling to find them with his camera. You can see them with his eyes. So many of you agreeing with me that it's a female, some not so much. 
Well, time will tell. I don't suppose it makes an enormous difference. I think in the greater scheme of our enjoyment of the cat. Well, yes, they are inherited 100 to the extent that, you know, they're born with them. So the code for where their spots are is found in the DNA of the com or the combination of the DNA between the mother and the father. And so therefore, yes, they must be inherited. But I think what your question really is, is, is the shape that the spots are arranged in some way related to the shape of the spots of the parents. And I suppose it must be, but I really couldn't tell you. So we know that, you know, for example, Karula had that wow that was written across her forehead. And if you never met Karula and you're a new viewer, she had a distinctive set of spots across her forehead that basically spelt out the word wow, but none of her offspring have got that. And so I think it's, I actually think it's very dangerous to look at an animal and say, oh, well, you know, we can see, or a leopard, we can see that that's the offspring of x and y there's nothing wrong with doing it it's great fun to do it but i, I don't know I, I really think it's quite inaccurate most of the time oh this is a bit distressing David has managed to find, yet again, what the rest of us have failed to find. Yeah, I'm seeing for the first time on my own some lion, but this looks like a young sub-adult, uh, a sub-adult uh, lion here, which does not look to be in very good shape. Doesn't look to be in very good shape, and you can tell uh, he has uh, a very big wound. If Craig, you go to the back left there, foot, you can see that gushing wood there. I wouldn't know what might have caused that wound. And I think he must be part of the Nukuma pride and most likely was separated. And what cats will do if they... All right, uh, just one second. I want to let my friends know. Uh, stations at uh, Twin Dumps. I got one. Uh, lioness, one, one lion at Twindam, Twindam. And, uh, yeah, they are, he, he is not looking very good shape. A bit thin. I don't think it has been eating the last uh, few days. Uh, just one minute. I want to let my friend know who I am. And looks very thin. You can see the rib cage there. And definitely it was not able to keep with pace with the other lions and it was left behind. And in this condition, not much it can do on its own. Eh? And unfortunately, we might lose it, say, to bigger or other predators like hyenas. So it's so close to water because it may chance any prey coming to drink and sneak on it and bring it down because at the moment it has to hunt, you know, for itself without uh, the rest of the pride. And you know, for lion success, numbers make a whole difference for them. On your own, it's very difficult to still make it, but not in this very bad shape. Eh? Yeah, looks not in very, very good shape. I do not know what, uh, you know, pride or, you know, group should belong to, but it doesn't look in very, very good shape. I wouldn't know what pride it is. I think the main, the main pride here is Nekuma, and I do not know what pride this one would belong to. Because the other one I have seen before and I would write on the hip but this one has it on the left leg which is a bit a uh, unusual place to get
Christus says, Salala Sabadot, you're right, could be, and yes, maybe it is saying yes, it's just answering you and saying yes, they are. Maybe from the face you can identify it much better. I haven't seen it before myself, I'm seeing it for the first time. And it looks to me like a very young sub adult male. A young sub adult male, that's what it looks to me, a bit of mane maybe on the neck. And I wouldn't know how it got that big wound, and that one might have caused it to be separated from the main pride. I think so, still too young to be out of the main pride. You know how males, uh, once they get big, they are kicked out of the pride and go leave or go form a coalition with the other males. Could have been a bit early for it to do that, and if for that reason, I don't see it making, making it. I've seen animals in the bush in general, what would happen if one is sick for one reason or another, they tend to leave it behind. They don't want to, you know, tag along with it. Because if hyenas would target, you know, the animals, this one will definitely be a straight choice. These things will happen once in a while. Could have been a bite maybe from another lion. Because I'm trying to explore that wound. And yes, it's pretty sad, very, very sad, and uh, not what I expected to bump by the waterhole here. I was looking for some more alive and fresh, good-looking predators or lions or leopards, maybe having a drink or Ellis, but then just bumped into this. I wasn't sure initially whether it was a, a big leopard laying, you know, just by the waterhole. Yeah, looks very sad. I do not see it making it, and that is the rule here in the jungle. Once things go wrong, go wrong, and uh, yeah, that's how things go. Apart from that wound, it looks everything else has been very good shape. You can see the pose there, if you look carefully, Craig, on the pose. Everything else looks perfect to me. Strong, good-looking pose. But I think that wound will have been the genesis of it is problems. Let's find out if Raf could get a much healthier pride of lions. Now, everyone, it's still part of the process. We are working our way round about, um, and we, we're coming back down to the drainage line now. Um, we're going to go into the Moanini and see if we can pick up any tracks there, because these these elephants have really shifted these lions around, and as I say, it's made our life quite difficult. But um, we're going to head down into the drainage line and see if we can get any fresh tracks once again. And that's all I'm focusing on at the minute. And it's all very quiet. The elephants seem to have moved off now um, in, a, in a southerly direction. And we now are just coming down into the river line. That's where we potentially get, could get quite a lot more tracks. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do now. But as we move, you know, there might be one or two stragglers of that uh, bigger herd of elephants. So we're just moving through quietly. And we also know that there are lions in the area. We're not too far from Twin Dams where David is. Is. So uh, we know that there's a lion there as well. And if he's a little bit sick, uh, he can be quite aggressive if he is like that. Potential is that he'll probably run away from us, which lions generally do. But if he's a little bit sick, a little bit um, under the weather, they can get a little bit uh, grumpy. And they can then obviously also attack you when, um, in that kind of uh, sort of frame of mind. You know, it's a little bit like a cornered animal. So we do need to just move through slowly. That's what we're doing the whole time. We are now coming down into this uh, bigger drainage line here. So if there are any tracks, well, we're going to check it out. And I'm just uh, hoping that Ferb doesn't fall over and hit his head. But uh, you, you can see here as we come down, once again, a lot of elephant tracks. There's big ones, there's small ones, there's a nice youngster, probably a teenager. 
And they've been having an absolute ball. I've seen that they've been uh, sort of sitting on their bums. They've been throwing sand on themselves. And as I say, look at that. There's another one there. Lots of tracks. There's elephant signs all over the show. So, as I say, we just need to be a little bit calm, a little bit quiet. We stop quite a lot and we listen for any breaking branches. And especially when you come down in a drainage line like this, very important just to remember that you need to keep your senses and um, because you don't want an elephant to be above you because uh, they can really grow wings if they, if they are above you. So we just need to be careful. If they are above us, well, we just need to exit out on the side. But we're going to be looking for tracks. That's what we're doing now at the moment. Just trying to see if these lions have moved along down the river here. Now, Alpine Wolf Girl, a lion will be affected by a snake bite, and I've actually seen lions that have died as a result. Um, I think Cape Cobra, Black Mamba, um, that uh, it can kill them. So they would be very wary of snakes, uh, but I, I'm sure that you know that cats are quite... Um, they're quite good around um, snakes, and they almost have an, a, a hypnotic effect on um, some of the lions, as, uh, some of the snakes as well. You know, they sort of watch them, and the snake starts doing a little bit of a wobble, almost like what the Indians do with their, their little flutes. Um, I've actually seen my domestic cat at home uh, with a runkos, which is part of the cobra family. Um, he actually almost got this, this snake quite hypnotized and eventually attacked it and killed it. And that was just a little domestic cat. So lions are quite good around snakes, um, but if they do get bitten, there's every chance that they could die. So they do need to be quite careful. Once again, lots of elephant signs here. This looks like possibly a trunk, again, like we saw yesterday, that has been pressed up into the soil here. Um, they're obviously being dragged. You know, they, they often press the soil and throw it over themselves, etc. Sounds like there's a game viewer just over there in front of us. But um, the, the, the tracking afternoon continues. Once again, lots of elephant signs here. They've been moving up and down. Um, let's send you back to that beautiful leopard with James. Right, well, we have pulled off quite a um, driving feat to get into this position. Uh, we have got some wonderful signal, thankfully. And we're now really very close to the tree where the kill is. And there we have our gorgeous leopard. And thankfully, she seems to be a little less ornery than her mother. Her mother is, of course, Tundi, and as many of you will know, Tundi has a, well, she takes takes exception quite often to human presence and gives us little snarls and growls every so often. But this cat doesn't seem to be doing the same, which is magnificent. Ah, James Richard, I know you won't believe me when I say this, but I nearly said to you, this is one of the whites. And when we talk about that, talked about that butterfly. But thank you very much for that. She's just burying some stomach contents, I think. Oh, look at this. <laughs> and yes, absolutely, James Richard, you say the whites can be difficult. The whites are very difficult. That was an African common white. Thank you very much, James Richard. I've just found it on my app. We'll show it to you just now after this leopard's climbed the tree. I would concur. It's so much easier when people just tell you the answers. Now, don't go away now. We've, you have no idea what it's taken to get to where we are now. Please. You don't understand. Yes, cut in the cup now. All right, we'll see if we can get a better view. I believe David's sickly lion has lifted its head. She's gone across there. This is a good sign that she is down but not out. And that, oh, this now makes me feel much better than before. I almost, you know, drove away and I was telling Craig, you know, it's not very... A uh, nice uh, view we got of this sickly and uh, not looking good uh, lion. We better, uh, you know, drive away. But then a few times just put its head up, looked at us, head down. And now 
it's a good sign. Crip just told me so the same line like a month ago and they you know he also thought it would not make it so maybe my thinking another one month will be gone could be very wrong and it might even make it who knows unfortunately what we do we'll always have some vet uh you know rangers or vet doctors who are trained to do the such cases but if this was a natural wound or the whole situation is all natural and then we normally will not interfere and we'll just leave it and you know mother nature to take care of itself maybe the lion might do a better job than maybe having a vet doctor come in to attend it I mean, that's a great face. Look at that profile. I mean, he looks like he got a lot of future in him, eh? Exactly, Cassie, you're right. And uh, if a month ago, uh, you know, Craig saw it looking bad that it is now, then it will mean it might get there. It will stick around by the water and sneak on the animals that might come for a drink or even little birds and then it will go into regain energy and once it's back and rolling it will definitely make up and then maybe if it belongs to whatever pride they're going to you know re reunite again and make it in life. looking towards the water hole direction and just looking at the birds some doves flying from a distance definitely that's not for you Trick so I agree with you hopefully you know he'll find his pride and that's what will make the difference because ideally if the pride will hunt certainly certainly he'll get something to eat certainly he'll get something to eat you are very right and once you know he start eating he'll start building his body and then you know he'll get the ship back and energy and he'll also help them in hunting i'm not changing my mind i think he'll make it i was a bit pessimistic but i think you know he will definitely make it and let's find out what Kuchava and the cub are doing as I leave this lion here and maybe hopefully things will get better and we'll see it again soon. So I've now changed my mind. Mm. <laughs> I'll probably change my mind again but we just got a nice view there of the underside of the tail Ooh. and then I suddenly thought no maybe it's a male <laughs> I don't know what it is any of you saying female let's just stick with that I mean that was my initial impression so I'm gonna stick with that unless I see some orbs I could be entirely wrong I accept that completely This is a very restless little thing, not sitting still, it's just come down this sort of little track and gone up again, back to mum, and now it's doing it again. It would be very convenient if this bush wasn't in the way. There's mum. We'll watch carefully to see the arrival of the little one. I can only imagine the reaction if I suggested we name a female or a leopard cub after an avocado variety. Well, I think that would be a disaster. The reason I say that, of course, because the avoca males that we spoke about the other day, uh, avoca, the farm they're from, uh, is in fact avocado in French. So we're not going to name this leopard cub after avocado varietals. Probably, maybe wine varietals, you know. We could call her Syrah or something like that. That would be nice. No, Kirsten, we're not going to call her Sauvignon Blanc. We're going to call... Exactly. Um, <laughs> we're going to get ourselves in trouble, Sebastian. Uh, Gochava, Cindy, means... To be scared, it's a verb. That means to be scared. Angie, sorry. 
So Guchava, yeah, if you said, um, and Achava, it would mean uh, I'm afraid. So it's the infinitive of the verb to be scared. Guchava. And I suspect it was because she was quite shy as a cub. I did not know her as a cub. I didn't think I ever met her as a cub. So let's just go through Tundi's offspring. I'm sure I've missed some. I mean, the ones I know are Tamba, Guchava, and um, obviously Tlalamba. Does she have any other extant offspring that I know of? that I don't know of. Let me have a look, see. She could easily. And Luisa's Bahuti. Was that Tandy's cub? Yes, I think it was. Thank you, Luisi, for telling me about Bahuti. I don't know what Bahuti means. Oh, she's got quite a few. I'm just looking here. Two cubs in 2010. Paulo, we should name it after a varietal of apple juice. Absolutely great idea. Talisker, I think, is what we should call her. So she had two cubs. This is Tandy in 2010. Oh, but they're both deed, I think. Yes. No, one went independent. Then two cubs in 2012, both killed by the Styx pride. That's not very nice. Then was Bahuti. And then two male cubs that disappeared. And then Guchava. And then in 2016, two cubs, two female cubs disappeared. But we have Tamba, obviously. And now Tlala. We had a viewer come and see us today, um, and she, she says she's from Australia, and it was wonderful to have that Australian accent say, Si, where's Rebel? Mm -hmm. I said, who? Because I'd forgotten about this. Remember, we called Tlalamba Rebel Wilson because she was so rebellious as a youngster. Obviously, that was rejected as a name, but that's what they refer to. Leung Tlalamba as in the Melbourne household from which she comes. He's rebel. You know, Tlalamba, or what do you call her now? That's my Australian accent, in case you were wondering. It's probably not very good. I apologise. Kirsten, you're not allowed to say no. Because actually, I don't think it's too bad. I'm just trying to be self deprecating. I think my Australian accent is really not bad at all. I would like any of our Australian viewers to either back that up or tell me I'm talking rubbish. Perhaps X Ranga is watching in Tasmania and he can tell me if my Australian accent is terrible or if it sounds vaguely Australian. Outstanding sighting, this. This. <laughs> Outstanding. Where's the cub gone? We've also got two Australians on Dive Live, so I'm listening to them daily and learning how they speak. I'll stop now. Oh, yes, as uh, Kirsten says, I must do the breathing as well, not just the talking. So we have Pat from Adelaide, and Pat sees a ras swimming by, and he goes, Oh, look at that, there's a ras. And then Simone says, And a turtle, Pat, there's a turtle. If you haven't caught Dive Live yet, we will, well, you can't catch it unless you're one of the beta backers. It's in private beta testing at the moment. Uh, we are going live, I think, on the 2nd of June is when we will open it live to the public, free of charge. 
and you will meet Pat and Simone and Lauren, who are presenters there. Lauren has a very gentle Scottish burrow about her. It's very pleasant to listen to. <laughs> Chow says, I sound like an Aussie living in Georgia. <laughs> I think that's quite unfair of you, Joe, but uh, you're probably absolutely right. I have driven guests from Dalton, Georgia. Old lady, she about 80 years old, she said to me, I come from Dalton, Georgia, carpet capital of the world. At least you said I sound like Eliza Doolittle. Wasn't Eliza Doolittle a cockney? She would have said, there's an old leopard over there. It's quite a... Those very attractive leopards. Look at him there. Oh, now he's hungry. He's going to have a little bit of a drink. Super. Mother's given her a little lick. Don't know if it's male or female yet. Hopefully we'll find out soon. Oh, very nice. Gorgeous spots. Lovely golden colour. I thought that's what Eliza Doolittle sounded like. But maybe I was wrong. I don't know. I haven't seen my fair lady. I'll stop now, everybody. I'm sorry. And X Ranger is not commenting from Tasmania. Kirsten says because he's embarrassed. I think that's probably quite true. Isn't that a perfect little scene? So this youngster at four months, look at kneading with those vicious little claws. You can just see her or him kneading away there. Little youngster is pretty much weaned by now at four months. It should be around three, between three and four months they will be weaned. So the milk will be drying up and he's going to have to start eating diker and other such meat fairly soon. I'm just going to get hold of Andrew on the radio. Go ahead. Affirmative, come along Euphorbia Road from the westernmost point and she's in the drainage. You'll see the vehicle tracks. It's very difficult to get in here though. Yeah, and in fact, are, are you driving a cruiser? I don't think they'll see this from the top. No, I don't think you're going to get in here in a cruiser. Um, if she moves, I'll keep you posted. A cruiser is the big game driving vehicle that they use. Can't break it, but you also won't get it into a position like we've got this one. Rusty, of course, is imminently breakable, but much more maneuverable. Philip, I think they do. In fact, I'm almost 90% I'm certain that they do. I think the lack of practice brought to bear on a first litter, uh, the even the mechanics of it, you know, I think it's quite difficult for a first birth, not nearly as difficult as it is with hyenas, for example, or human beings, but it's certainly not easy, and the lack of experience, I think, probably does result in a certain amount of death or higher proportion of first litters dying than subsequent ones. And eventually, I suspect she will get up and climb the tree, which will be wonderful. Now, uh, there are five or six different people, I think, or no, two or three different people looking around where Ralph is for the Inkahumas, and I don't think any of them have had a great deal of success yet. 
Yeah, well, there hasn't been too much success, everybody. Um, and I think these lines have pretty much given us the slip. And I think as a result of the elephants moving through the area, uh, they've pushed these lines. And it's almost a case of us trying to relocate uh, on some of the boundaries, see if these lines have actually maybe moved off the property. And that's all we've been doing is just trying to get to all sorts of different roads and just see if we can find the lines that have crossed um, but no such luck for now. And as I say, there could have been elephants that have walked their tracks flat too. So it's all been complicating the, the entire tracking process. But, well, we don't give up. We just keep walking. And that's the only way for us to try and see if we can pick up the next new signs of them. We've now walked through the uh, sort of um, the Umlawati. And we were almost at Twin Dams. But that's where David is with that sickly-looking lion. So... We're not going to go all the way there, and there was no, no sign that the lines had gone down into the river. So, once again, we're out on one of the little two tracks, just trying to see if these lines have popped out and popped through. Now, it sounds like James has been having lots of fun uh, doing all sorts of different um, accents there. And what about the, the Cockney accent from uh, Londoners? Uh, there's some good ones there. Why don't you tell us some of yours? I know the, the apples and pears for, for the stairs. And did he do that one? And what about trouble and strife for the wife? Now there's lots of those. Oh, what's that? And that looks like a big piece of poo. And it's probably come from a guinea fowl. Now, why I say that uh, is because of the size of it. But also remember that birds, they do um, defecate and urinate from a single exit uh, called the cloaca. Cloaca, cloaca, um, and that's the white part of it is the urine um, or the uric part of it there. So that definitely, I believe, is a guinea fowl turd. So there's been some guinea fowl moving through here, but uh, so signs of birdies, but no signs of lions of, as of yet. And yeah, from where they were sleeping a little bit earlier, that's. Uh, where we had tracks going around and around and then uh, and then elephant tracks all over the place so now we're just looking looking and trying our best we've got all sorts of little antelope that have been walking on the road this one here looks to be like it's possibly a nyala once again there a nice little track that is it's walked up the road going in that direction but also nice and and you see how everything has been cleaned up after the rain and now we're getting nice fresh new little uh, trackies that have come through that looks like it could be a kudu went through there and I was also we just earlier saw some kubu berries a very red fruit um, the jackal berries are also in fruit so lots of uh, the grey go away birds and they've all been having a good time because lots of fruit around with the guaris the jackal berries the brown ivories um, and the kubu berries all fruiting at this time of year. So the jackal berries aren't quite ripe just yet, but they will be soon. And this here looks like an old buffalo dung site. And I'm sure you would have seen a lot of the leopards have been rolling in it and feeding on it. It's actually quite crazy. I saw uh, Shudulu. She had it like on a she had it on her head and almost as a as a necklace as well. I'm still intrigued as to why they do it and why they like to feed on it as well. Um, but very, very fine ruminant dung, and it almost goes into a fine powder. You know, they chew their cud, they regurgitate, and they swallow it down again. So and this is quite an old one, and it's probably from that one dugger boy that we had mulling around for a while. Not sure where he's gone. Uh, he's disappeared. I haven't seen him for the last few days as well. Now, it's... Uh, it's just one of these afternoons where we haven't found too much, but we're still on the lookout. We're still going to try our best to find these lion tracks. Um, and let's... Oh, lots of elephant activity there. I'm going to try and catch up with them. Maybe we can. In the meantime, off to David, who's on the move as well. Right, still thinking about that poor young male there, and uh, I'm sure he'll make it. And got some elephant now coming up to uplift my spirits again to where they were before I met that young sub-adult. And we've got a nice herd of Ellis here, and this will make me feel good one more time. 
At what angle do you want, Craig? <laughs> we have them all the way, like they're doing a small parade for us. So I need to know what Craig exactly, what angle he wanted me to position the car. That's good. All right, let's enjoy these alleys and they'll make us feel good and forget. And I think most of the viewers uh, said that was some young, uh, young sub adult male. So let's agree. I agree with you. It was a young sub adult male. And let's all now celebrate these alleys and uh, ho keep, keep cheering up that that young male will make it and will definitely be able to rejoin a particular or oh, the pride it belongs to. And if you look, Craig, at the one on the very left back there is coming chewing a uh, branch and just making sure that everybody is doing what it's supposed to do and looks like a big cow to me and most likely she could be pregnant enjoying her snack as she moves or tugs along and i'm sure she's the last one in this herd of ellies great light and very uplifting spirits now to see healthier good-looking animals Craig, do you see that massive bull there to the right? He's huge, eh? I do not know what he could be doing here. He doesn't look to be in mass to me, but he's one massive bull with his head of elephants. He must have been digging some mud somewhere. He's left task is full of mud or trying to uproot something. Very good job, Craig, there. Great background of the bush veld of this area. Paula, hello and how are you doing today? And yes, the Ellies are having a great stroll and wonderful light, enough to eat the golden grass there, you know, different shades of grass. I mean, of trees, as I said earlier in the background. Paula, I agree with you, that is a great sighting. And Ellies will always entertain you and bring back your spirits when you think of that uh, sub adult male we saw earlier. I was just thinking to get to my Chitwa waterhole earlier to see whether we could see Ellie's drinking, and there they are. Two big bulls, yeah! Look at that dust bath. All right, so they can do it again. Hmm, <laughs> did you hear that? Could be a bit of a disagreement there with between the Ellis. In general, very peaceful animals, unless there's an important issue they need to sort. So trying to catch up with the rest, and I'm sure most likely to be going to have a drink somewhere. They're going towards that sub alert male lion we saw. Hopefully, they do not cause it a lot of pain or they cause it more anguish. That's the direction they're facing right now. And I would say it's about 500 meters from here. Oops. Those two there are having a bit of a scuffle. And what I found out, if there's a bull that in must and she joins the female or female herd, the first one, two days, they're never very comfortable with the bull and they'll always try if they can't get it out or if there's any female in here, it will try to run away from the male that is in must. Hopefully that will settle down. And they continue cheering us up. 
we'll try and head out in the other direction and see whether we might see them around the Chito waterhole and again, you know, having a drink. James still having a wonderful time with the leopard and the cub. They've gone behind the bush, unfortunately, but I think it's going to be worth us waiting here until they've decided to go back towards the food and eat it. I also think that we are not going to be here after dark, so just because we don't want to attract any attention, obviously, we can very sensitively watch them in the darkness with infrared, but because we'll have to make such a noise getting out of here, um, I'm going to suggest that we leave before dark. I'm sure no one will object. Each situation is different and needs to be judged on its merits, and that will be my call on this one. Cindy, in the days before a GPS, it would have been very difficult for us to learn the roads on Torchwood, but we've got a map, and yeah, it's pretty simple because you just turn on your GPS if you're confused. Ooh, quickly across to David. Oh my God, we are seeing something I've not seen here. We got three bulls. I was just talking of a female who could be in Eastras here and we got three bulls who are just facing, chasing her all around and they are all out on her and what a situation this is. I hope you can hear all that. And I can tell you, they came round us and they just surrounded us. Three male bulls and they're just chasing one cow all over. And I'm not sure all of them are in must, but they're chasing the poor cow. She can't even keep the pace. I mean, my heart went racing and Craig was like, David, what's happening here? And I'm like, I do not know what's happening here. And they all came running around the car and the poor female. And then there's one young calf that kept running. I don't know whether that's the mother or the auntie. And she's very, you know, feeling sorry for the, for the other cow there. Let's just turn around and try to see what they can read. Uh, this kind of a scenario, I haven't seen that before. Three big bulls. All of them, they look to be in mast, which I was, I might swallow my words, and chasing this poor cow. And there's one pretty young calf running so close to that cow, not sure whether she wanted to help her or thinking, what do I do now or what's happening here with all these males running around. Angie, well, well, the bulls had the baby. In general, they do not do that because their interest, Angie, it is the cow. But I'm not sure the cow is interested or she ready to mate with these bulls here. But it's so funny to see like three bulls together wanting to mate with one cow, Angie. Eh? But the calf kept running close to that cow. Either by instinct was like, I want to help you out of this situation. These three bulls are for you. I do not know, but let's see whether we'll keep a distance, not getting so close. Sometimes when Ellie's are in must, they're a bit cranky sometimes and a bit grumpy. You never know. So let's just watch what everything now seems to have calmed down. And you can see now the calf is the one in the middle there. Can you see you can get the calf there while they're doing a bit of dust bath. That's the calf, and that calf kept running close to the cow that was being chased by all these three bulls. I've never seen that before. I can't smell or I can't see any sign of must in these three bulls, and the poor cow kept running and running. Angie. I think your question is when female elephants go in Istras, correct? Uh, it's anything from 
10 to 12 years angi, the first time they go in estrus and they are sexually mature is anything 10 to 12 years. But at times we have seen cases where even at nine years they could be in estrus and they could mate and conceive. But the average is always 10 to 12 years. I hope Angie watched all that commotion there. Carla, you're asking if the three bulls will fight over her. In general, what would happen if of the three they'll be the main or the dominant bull or the old one? He ends up winning and he would make sure all the sub adult bulls are thrown out by virtue of their size and their strength. Normally the big ones will get the young sub adults out and not give them any, any mating rights. But this particular case, it was quite unusual. The three of them, to me, they all seemed of the same size and maybe that was the problem. There couldn't be a clear winner who would mate. And I guess the female also did not want if they were young, she had a choice to wait to mate with a proper, full, mature bull. And maybe that's what was happening here. Three young ones wanting to mate you know, with her at the same time. And she was like, no, no, no. But if there were three and of the three, one of them was older and bigger, chances are he would fight them out and he would be the one who would mate. That hasn't happened. And it's like everything has calm down now is all quiet again and let's wait a few moments and see whether the drama might set again as a reposition and move forward a little bit this is quite exciting i even have forgotten totally about the sick uh, sabadot uh, lion craig what do you think of that was it dramatic yeah craig says he hasn't seen something like that before and he was like, we had to be careful because they came surrounded the cow and all of them trumpeting and the dust and the poor cow right sandwiched by three males and the young calf running very close to the cow, not knowing exactly what to do. And that was still doing a bit of dust bathing there, Craig, if you look carefully. That was a great moment. Excellent lighting, excellent. I agree with you, Casti. Well done. So true, very good. So we've got the two bulls now tagging along. What should happen, Chris, sorry for that little technical issue. What would happen, Chris, if the matriarch could pick that kind of commotion, they have been known to intervene and just make sure if the bulls are young, they have been known to push them out of the herd. And also that helps to avoid inbreeding. Yes, Chris, we have seen once in a while the matriarch being very intelligent, full of wisdom and being in charge and you know elephant heart or elephants are very matriarchal we'll have seen the matriarch coming in and stepping in and making sure if those bulls or young bulls in the 20s or the sub adults they don't qualify to meet she'll always make sure they're out and again as i said that also helps to avoid inbreeding I'm not giving up on these elephants yet. If you could see a similar drama again, that would be exciting and maybe we'll be more relaxed and hopefully nothing big because at one moment, Craig was like, what are we gonna do here? But I said, stay cool, we don't move and they just came surrounding us. And then they left. Ruff, tell us what you're up to as I follow my elephants. Well, everyone, I am an avid fisherman, and, uh, well, there's nowhere I can fish around here. So what I've decided to do is um, uh, go fishing for a little spider. Now, 
Don't worry, everybody. There's nothing that I'm doing here that is going to injure this little female that hopefully I can entice just to the entrance here, and we'll just have a little look at her. It's we just I'm trying to bring her up just slowly because she's just attacking the little end of my grass stalk and I just want to try and see if we can just get her to a position where you, you maybe be able to see her that's all I'm going to do so she is biting and she's holding on to my little grass stalk and I just want to see if I can bring her up a little bit higher that you can see her you see she might get a little bit nervous so then I just drop it down again and see if she see if she bites there she's biting again all she does is grab onto the grass stalk and then uh, I try and bring her up but sometimes they do get a little bit nervous so let's see she's biting there she's grabbing on again let's see if I can just slowly bring it up and be quiet she might come where you can see her nicely let's see slowly but surely here she comes come on girl there she is I might even just shine my torch on her so that you can see her and then we don't need to bring her up any further there she is there we are hello girl how's that Fook? Oh, yes, I can see I'm, uh, right out of here. okay let's see beautiful colors on her that's a baboon spider and she's just holding on to the end of the grass there see that That's very cool. Can you see her? It's a bit difficult for you there. <laughs> it's uh, my little way of fishing here. Ravinda, it's um, probably about half the size of my palm. Uh, but it's a very pretty looking spider from this angle. And they call them baboon spiders because on the tips of their legs oh, it's just gone down a little bit further in the burrow and these are mygalomorphs so they would be coming out at night running around actively searching out <laughs> sorry Ferg you're finding it a bit difficult there okay so they would be coming out onto the ground at night and actively going and hunting uh, little things uh, all over the place and they call them baboon spiders there she's really pulling on that piece of grass now because of the type of pads that they have on the end of their feet very similar to that of baboons um, and she's really holding on to this now and i just want to see if we can maybe entice her up a little bit again she's really after this grass stalk obviously Afterwards, I will get rid of it, but they do get quite nervous when we... There she is. Can you see her now, Ferg? There she is. There she comes. Hello, big girl. There we go. Did you see that? That's very cool, eh? Okay, I'm going to stop disturbing her. She'll be waking up very soon, and um, she'll be going off hunting. So we'll leave her to rest. Uh, it, the sun's going down. It's nearly time for her to come out and hunt. Speaking of hunters, we're still with one over at James. Well, this hunter's not doing a great deal of hunting. I'm just going to attempt a movement here, everybody. To up. Well, let's just wait and see. I'd rather not move because I will have to make a bit of a crunching noise over a branch. I don't want to do that. Let's give her one minute to decide whether she's coming back to feed. Because the sun is now unfortunately about to sink, which means we've probably got, I'm going to say, 25 minutes left here. Well, we do want a better look than this, my dear. Please. We've come all this way. It's our first day here. Okay, let's move. Hmm? Shall we move? Shall we stay? Shall we move? She looks like she's getting active. Yes, Trish, absolutely. The cub should be eating meat at four months. It was probably starting to eat meat at about six weeks already and it now should be almost completely weaned I'm sure she's producing a little bit of milk but it won't be a lot 
Here we come. Fantastic. She want me to go back a bit, Seb? Mm, there's one. You sure? Yeah. Because if she comes up the tree, you no, you'll be right there, huh? Uh, yeah. yeah Hello, my girl. How marvellous to see you. <laughs> you do have a resemblance to your grandmother and your mother, you know. Again, I say that fully in the knowledge of what I said to you earlier, that it is very, well, it's not dangerous, but it's uh, not necessarily accurate to say. And here comes the little one as well. This could get quite exciting, everybody. Don't start screaming, just be quiet. Okay, I'll tell you if she comes to the tree. So I'm just ask me to tell him if she comes to the tree so that we don't miss her climbing. She's calling. Okay, I'm just going to reverse very slightly. They're not reacting at all to our car noise, so I'm not worried about that. They will, however, if I manage to smash a tree. How's that? This is where we stopped initially, everybody. That's where she was. The reason I'm a little bit nervous of the movement around here is because her name is Guchava, and I have no experience of her. So far, she has shown very little chavering. She doesn't seem very scared at all. I'm sure that thing was a little bit scared before it died. Ugh. Come on, kids, it's time to eat. Get up there, do your job. Feed your child and then give her a bath. Put her to bed, or him. Just got the last bits of golden light on the top of the tree there. I think she's gone to sleep on the sand below. <laughs> I'm afraid I've got no idea, Ashlyn. You say that certain animals that have meat that is easier for a youngster to eat I don't think so. I would imagine there are probably certain parts of an animal that are easier for a cub to eat. The offal, for example, the fat-rich organs, kidneys and liver, etc. I think they probably are. But I don't think that there's necessarily an animal that's easier to eat. I guess it's probably easier to get into a scrub hare and devour that, but I don't think the meat is necessarily more nutritious for them, or necessarily better for them. Seb, I'm going to sneak slightly forward again because I think she's lying down in the drainage. And I think the cub might just be on the bank still. No, no, they're both down. No, I'm afraid not. Uh, that accent, Kirsten, is known as my Mongolian accent. No, let's keep going back. All right, we're going to try and avoid hitting a tree and some such. Ralph apparently is being an artiste. Well, look at that everybody. The sun is now heading down towards the horizon. It looks like uh, the threat of rain that we had a little bit earlier has definitely subsided and the clouds have dissipated. 
but it's going to be a wonderful, beautiful sunset. Now, we've been trying to catch up with these Unkuhumas pretty much the entire afternoon. And we started off where they were seen earlier today. Um, and we have been going around in circles. They've been giving us the slip. And it seems like we've literally walked around them. Because here we have now found where they crossed the road behind us uh, and just a little bit up from us. Um, they've come along, one of them has come along the path here. He's landed on the road, so he's jumped from there. He's landed on the road, and from there, he's jumped over. So this says to me that this cat was in a bit of a, a motion of getting away from something, and we know what they were getting away from. They were getting away from the elephants, which were literally pushing up just behind them. Now, we were just a little bit down there. We've walked along the Mlawati, and we've come around this way. And while we were doing that, we've just headed up in front of them and now come back behind them again. Now, the vehicles are... There, there is somebody that has relocated, the Unkohumas, and, in fact, uh, David is just up the road from us here. He's on his way now to go and catch up with the Unkohumas that we have literally walked around. And there's a few other tracks of them on the road here as well, and Another one came through on this track here. He jumped onto the road there and he jumped across. You can see where I put the circle on it. And another one coming through over here and it's also jumped across. And these lions are just off from us a little bit over in the bush over there. So we've literally walked around them, but nonetheless, at least it hasn't been a total failure. They have been located, and David, he's going to be on his way in there uh, at the moment. And we also had to stay a little bit away because we were right near to where David had those elephants that were running around all over the place. They were just behind us a moment ago, so we had to hot-foot it down the road um, because we weren't sure if they were coming towards us or going away from us. And elephants in that kind of mode, obviously, you want to be quite careful of, because if they're chasing each other around and you get in the way, well, um, it can lead to trouble. So luckily we managed to get down the road, and in the meantime, uh, we then picked up on the tracks. So I'm going to then hand over to David. He's going to go and head in and try and find those Nkuhumas for you. I think we've done our job at least, but um, while David is re relocating, let's head you back to James and uh, Kuchava. Well, no, not quite a Guchava. Uh, that is Guchava's supper, a dica. That's the abdominal cavity. No, that's the thoracic cavity. That's the chest of the dica. You can see the lungs are gone, and I guarantee you at least one of them disappeared into the gullet of little baby leopard. I can hear a bit of movement now. They are definitely in the drainage line, on the sand. And just hear some rustling of grass. Ooh, ooh, there we go. Just jumping around. Baby's getting a little bit restless, obviously. We did try and get a view in there, and it was impossible. I'm afraid. Oh, here we go. Action stations, Sebastian. Action stations. We're about to see a leopard. I'm being an idiot. I'm going to move two feet forward. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Perfect view. Beautifully still out here now. Yes, Mr. Michael, it absolutely is. The fastest way for you to make enemies out here is to find something, not call it in, and then be caught. So it is completely necessary. As soon as you find something, 
you need to call it in so that the others using the reserve that you're on can come too. Because if you are, develop a reputation for hiding sightings, you'll get yourself into the very uncomfortable position of not being called into sightings. So that's why it's one of the most important things to do as soon as you find something is announce where it is. It can be deeply, deeply painful because radio procedures are some of the most talked about things that cuts at the base of the tree. Some of the most talked about things in any guide's meeting, deeply boring subject, but it really is, it can be a nightmare to try and operate in an area where people don't know how to use the radio properly. Stations, I've got Kuchava and Cub on Euphorbia Road, just to the west of the junction with Acacia Road. Animals are static, that's all you should have to say. Then what happens is that people don't listen to their radios. So that was him. Ah, what you got there? We've got uh, Kuchava and Cub. Ah, okay, thanks. Where are they? Uh, they're on Euphorbia Road. Ah, okay, thanks. Copy. Where on Euphorbia Road? Just west of Acacia Road Junction. Ah, okay. Are they moving? No, no, they're static. Ah, cool. Now not coming, thanks. By which time, of course, all your viewers have tuned out. one was thinking about having a climb, I think. Now I've gone back down. Ravinda, there were, and in fact Taylor thought that this kill had been stolen in its entirety this morning. There were four hyena around here. But somehow she managed to wrest some of it away from them and stick it in the tree here. And the hyenas have obviously disappeared because there's no way it should be on the ground like this if there were hyena around. You may have heard that in the background. It was not a military band starting up, it was an elephant playing its trombone. Can you see it? No, but I think it should be reversed. You think if we reverse? I think you're right, Seb. Sebastian giving me some instructions, some good ones. The day we get a Tesla electric car will be a wonderful day. I wonder if Elon Musk is watching. Elon, we'd like an electric car, please, a Tesla. You know those things you make? If we make one that looks a little bit like this, slightly better turning circle, silent. That would be wonderful, thank you. You can send it to Juma, Wasabi Sands, Greater Kruger National Park, South Africa. I'll pick it up at the gate. You won't be let in. <laughs> Got a No. I'm afraid I think this is probably going to be it. We'll try once more next to the tree. I'm not going to try and get any in there any closer and give everyone a fright. Well, we were trying to communicate with Ryan Gosling today. So there's no reason we shouldn't try and speak to Elon as well. These elephants are getting very quasi about something. Let's sit here another five minutes and then we're going to move on. Kirsten, has Elon replied? Oh, that's very nice of him. Apparently Elon has replied. He says, yes, maybe next year. I don't think that's very nice. I think he should give it to us now. Got them. What? A leopard. We've seen another leopard, all the same leopard. Elephants going crazy. Yes, I see the one you're looking at. That must be her. I think she's gone up to look what's going on there. Well spotted, Seb. Huh. Well, I think we should go up there. Let's go and find out what's going on. We'll leave the little cubby over here. This might 
gets a little hairy. Might be a little hairy on a drive, well, from a driving point of view, but we'll do our best. I think she's probably going to have a little bit of water, but I think she's left the cub here. Anyway, here we go. Hold on tight, everybody. The space is quite limited. All right there, Sebastian. No troubles that side? Good. Tight. Built a rather in whoa, convenient mound. Don't worry, that's just quarry bushes. Many of them. Now we must do a little bit of maneuvering. This is the way we came in, isn't it? That's a dead tree. Ah, good. Thank goodness David has managed to find the Ingohuma pride. Yes, finally, I'm seeing Ingohuma pride for the first very good trick for the first time, and it has been a lot of good search by Ruff, who has done a wonderful job. He has been tracking, and it is, you know, his good experience, a long time experience being in the bush that led him to know this uh, Nukuma Pride of Lions is here. I'm seeing it for the first time, and you can see they're just having a quiet moment. Very typical for lions. Sorry, there could be a vehicle moving in front of us, friends of ours who also have been on the sighting and definitely will have a better sighting in one minute. Uh, do you move forward a bit, Craig? Okay, just hold on for a minute. I'm going to reposition. How is that, Craig? Keep going. Good. Keep going. Right, today is a great day for Kat uh, Kuchava with the cab in the morning and again in the Sunset Drive. Pride of Lions in the morning and again on Sunset Drive. Couldn't be a better day than this. A wall full of cats, eh? Interesting how one is busy grooming and cleaning, you know, with the pool and one is just dead as well as asleep. I think that's the one that have always had a wound. I'm not sure. Craig, what do you think? All right. Let's first get to Kuchava and we'll be sure I'll be back with these lions. Well, she's come out towards a pan where there certainly used to be some water, but there isn't any at the moment. We can hear the elephants coming this way. If she goes back down into the drainage, I'm not going to follow everybody. I'm going to let her go down on her own. Now, leopards don't, in theory, need to drink. They will readily if they can but she's not necessarily going to go off and try and find some water if there isn't any here. We'll follow her along the road. There she goes. Elephants are screaming at each other. Lady Starfire, as far as I'm aware, Guchava has taken up the southern parts of Torchwood, south east and western parts of Torchwood, and I'm pretty sure that Inkanyeni holds the southwest. South, sorry, I'm talking rubbish. So Guchava southwest, Inkanyeni southeast, the sort of far western and then northern sections will be Tandi. But what happens central north and north east, I don't know. And Kanyeni might extend all the way to the boundary with Bifelsuk up in the north, but I'm not sure. 
I can actually see her, but that's because I'm sitting lower. Now she's going down. We're going to leave her now, everybody. She's going down it back into the drainage system. Down towards her baby. Whose sex remains fairly unclear at this stage. What a precious afternoon we've had with her. <laughs> Torchwood sure has delivered in heaps. Good. On we go. Let's go and see if we can find the elephants. It was fun, wasn't it? Well done, Taylor, for finding it this morning. We'll see if we can find the elephant. And I'm sure David's lions will get up eventually. Yeah, I'm enjoying these lionesses here. And they were doing a bit of aloe grooming a few seconds ago. And they're having a great time. And all females, I haven't seen any male, male yet. I have counted five females fully grown up to now. And this is the Nukuma pride of lions. Nukuma pride must be the main pride around this area when it comes to the lionesses. And I would wonder whether, you know, they might help or they might go and, uh, you know, look at the once young sub adult male we saw earlier and see if they can get some food for him if he can't get any for himself. Nice, Yun. Masi, you'd like to know how many lions have I counted? Up to now, I have counted five, and maybe I would think there's one. I'm only seeing the tail on the other side, maybe six, but what I can identify now positively, five so far, Masi. But I can see one slightly bit part, part of it, and I think six, and maybe I'll keep counting. Just hold on there, Masi, don't go away. Masi, how many have you counted? That's a good looking sub adult male. And that's the one that has a wound. And this is the one I was talking about earlier. Has a wound and on the hind quarters. Hopefully she got a turn this side again. And very similar wound to the one we saw earlier. I do not know what might have happened to them. I have no history, but Oops, you know, cuts as usual, flat, lay down, but still much entertaining than just laying down there without much action. Nice, beautiful life. I would imagine a bed like that. I do not know what they would think the grass could be if the human beings like bed sheets. And the Franklins in the background making noise. <laughs> Minamu, you'd like to know why these lions are sleeping in such a weird position. I would say if it's the, getting the end of the sun for the day of the light, they would want to hit the under parts of the bodies and maybe pick a bit of warmth before the sun, you know, sets. That's the only way I would guess and come at night, rarely will they sleep in that condition, they'll have to sleep with their tummies facing up, just watching out for any would be prey or any would be predators. So they know if anything, they better sleep backs down, facing up, because the night is gonna be the other way the whole night. I would guess, that's my guess. And of course, getting a bit of uh, a bit of sun before it sets. And just like us human beings, sometimes you notice you sleep at a particular angle, then you turn around, you know, our guess could be the same to these lions. But yeah, it's a very interesting position to see lions sleeping in that angle. Anna Marie, 
the Swahili word for the pride. I'll first give you the actual name for lions in Swahili and then get for you the pride. And lions, I'm sure if you saw the movie The Lion King, I'm sure you've been following lions for a long time, we say Simba, S-I-M-B-A, Simba, Simba, and then before we finish the drive today, I'll get to the pride name of lions. But in the meantime, keep Simba for now. Anna Marie, I hope you're happy with that. Yes, the lioness is the lioness. The um, Anna Marie says yes. It's a way of like yes, agreeing. You will keep Simba for now, and then we'll get to you uh, the pride name much later. You're licking that paw there. Very typical is cats with their rough tongues. Not sure there could be a thorn or some little irritation sometimes. The Franklins will always make them look up when they're not sure what cause they are. Yeah, that was really busy. Think just grooming herself. Be truthful, you're asking whether I can see Amber Eye, and for now I haven't seen it. And the moment I see her, I will let you know. And Craig, yeah, Craig, Amber Eye, you know, truthful, be truthful, would like to know whether you can see Amber Eye. The moment we spot it, Craig, let me know, and we can let her know when she comes to the screen. Nice little stretch there. Hello. That's much better. More activity. I'm going to say hello to the other one. The youngsters will behave typically that way. A little submission saying, you know. Ooh, it's greeting everybody. Hello there. Could be preparing time like to maybe wake up and start making ideas for getting some prey for tonight. They don't look to be in very bad shape. If you look at their bellies, they look to be in very good shape. All right, I'm not sure who this is, but she is more active than the rest of them. When the others are having the issue of cutting up, she is grooming, you know, scratching us here, looking around. She could be the pathfinder, not very sure. I don't know how they're behaving earlier today in the morning, but to me, I'm getting quite excited oh, by their mobility. Ah, very good, Heather Casty. And hopefully they better do a bit of uh, motion now and entertain us more, but I'm very impressed by their behavior now, knowing how lions or how cats can be flat, it's good to see one moving around. Temperatures have massively dropped. That's another good sign. I'm not sure what she wants to do or where she wants to go. Yeah, having a little break there. Beautiful face, beautiful lioness, a little mark on the neck there. I'm not sure it's like a little scar on the left side of her neck. Sorry if you see someone uh, shining some light on the face, uh, friends of ours, some guests also who are equally excited like me watching these lionesses. Why are you asking if there's a different word for lioness in Swahili? And you'll be surprised. Uh, for both sexes, males and females, we say the same word, Simba. So if it's a male, is Simba. If it's a female, is Simba. If I'm not very uh, wrong, when I did Spanish in college, a male lion would be Leon and a female would be Leona. Yeah, that's the one that has the wound. I'm not sure that one has a name. 
But Craig tells me she has done pretty well from when, you know, and that wound has improved massively from a couple of months ago. And that now reminds of the sub that we saw before. you know, just wondering whether he'll make it, but I think he will. I think, Massey, if you're still there, I've counted 10 now. I would have another one quick count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Massey, my count up to now is 10. Hopefully, I'll keep counting. There could be a vehicle just moving behind us. Nothing to worry. You can see the sub adults also moving in there, slowly going to the bush. They could be looking for some nice warm place to bed. That have just finished doing some business there. Look healthy and good looking to me. If you compare them to the sub adult we saw earlier with the wound. A little scratch. That is a very healthy lioness walking there. Very, very healthy. I'm not sure whether that's Amber, but uh, she looks to me, of all the ten I've counted, the best. Of course, some of them are young sub adults. We'll reposition forward a little bit. I can see some trying to scratch a tree there. I'm not sure they're trying to leave a message, but the youngsters there are scratching the trunk of that tree. How is that, Craig? All good? Stop there. Okay. See the youngsters there who's scratching the base of the trunk of that tree there. I'm not sure they're trying to leave a message what leopards will normally do. Sharpening their nails is a possibility. They'll always need the nails when they claw down the prey. Very, very important tool. It's a very important weapon for them when they go for zebras or wild beast or giraffes or buffaloes. The nails count along apart from the normal body strength. Just listen to them, you can just hear them scratch. Maybe practicing how they're going to bring the next. Very good, look at that. Thank you, Cast. If you can hear it softly. Or you could be practicing how they're going to be grabbing their next prey. Trying to eat to bite the back of that tree, eh? Ha! Huh. Very entertaining lions. So slowly moving in. Not sure they're getting to the Muruwati River. If they do, we're going to be joining them. And let's find out the latest from James Henry. Hello everybody, here we find ourselves at First Rock. It is so named because it is a rock and it is the first one. That's all I have to tell you about First Rock, other than it is a spectacular looking spot and you can see for, well, if not miles, certainly a few hundred yards or meters. It's a magnificent sundowner spot. And in fact, I have regularly heard of lions being here in the early mornings. We've heard of the Birmingham boys giving full voice in the morning sun from First Rock. So that's where we are now. Isn't it lovely? And I bet all of you are thinking, gee whiz, you deserve an apple juice. It's a pity you don't have one over there. And uh, I would agree with all of you. Did you just show them the sickle moon? No, Gorgeous no, sickle like moon with Venus over there. I'll stay off the car so that I don't bump it. Ain't that pretty? Gorgeous. 
Yeah, we came up here wondering if we could find the elephants. We did find them, but I'm afraid it was in a no signal zone. So we came back around to this part of the world. And then Venus is just next to it. I think it's Venus. You zoom out, ski, you'll see it to the right. There it is. And I don't think we'll see any moons on it like we do Jupiter. Why is that the case? Well, it's because... Which one doesn't have moons, Kirsten? Is it, is it Venus? One of the planets doesn't have any moons. And I forget which one it is. It's not Mercury. Kirsten's forgotten, you see. That's why she's not saying anything. Even young people forget things, Kirsten. It's not us old people that have to wear blankets on our leggies. Uh, Mercury and Venus, that's interesting, because I'll tell you what, Kirsten, the last time you asked me that on a drive, I said Mercury, you said no, Venus. That's what happened last time. That's known as bus throwing. That's known as bus throwing your colleague. Not very nice. Very unpleasant. No, I don't want to listen to you anymore. Stop speaking in my ear. I'm going to pull this out of my ear. No, I can't hear you anymore. See? <laughs> if you ever want to create consternation and anger in the final control, you can drive along like this. As they're talking to you, you go... Then you'll be in big trouble when you get home. But it's sometimes worth it just to do it once. I don't think I've ever actually done it before now. <laughs> Put on some lights. Let's go and see what else Torchwood has to offer this evening. Maybe Tundi. She's now not speaking to me at all. Such is the anger the roaring redhead rage that is coursing in the final control. There are people hiding under desks at the moment, I guarantee it. <laughs> Geraldine will be fetching ice. <laughs> Louise will be hiding under the desk, making a pillow, pillow fort with the, with the sofa cushions. <laughs> Oh, am I plugged in? No, no, no. Oh, oh, sorry. No, I wasn't ignoring her at all. I do apologise. I've obviously managed to damage my earpiece in all of that. So let's go across to David, uh, who is a bit more polite than I am. Right, the Nukhumas have decided to get into Muruamachi River, and I'm also doing the same and let's see what they want to do and how far they have gone. They're good. So they are not far from where we are and I'm sure they might be coming to Romat River because the sand here could be a bit warmer and maybe decide to spend the night here. So we are cruising in the same Romat River, me and Craig, and getting close to where they have gone. If they cross on the other side, we'll still be there with them, but I highly doubt they might want and come and settle by this warm sun now that has been out in the sun the whole day. As we left, I had counted 11. Let me see if that number is going to change. Getting pretty close to where they went and where they crossed, how they, where they entered the river. It's more of a sand river. I haven't seen any water in it. And Nukuhuma's Simba Simba. So we had to do a loop of about half a kilometer. Being agile, we were able to meander through through the thorn trees by the, the river bank. Unfortunately, me and Craig could not do that. So we had to go round. We have done that and I think you can be very close 
to where they should be now. And they're getting more playful as they were leaving that place we had them before. And it could be anywhere here now. Daniel, I will let you know once I look at their body language, you'd like to know if they're hunting and maybe yes, maybe no. So let me get close to them, Daniel, and I am going to look at their body language and we'll let you know, but it is possible. It is cool and such a pride will not go for many days without looking for food, eh? All right, it's it trying to get hold of them. James, tell us what you got for us at the moment. I got nothing for you at the moment, I'm afraid. We're just still laughing at our very funny joke that we made with the final control. Still not hearing any kind of laughter from that side, I'm afraid. No, just very businesslike at the moment. Um, what I would like to do eventually is learn David's accent because I really like it, but I cannot, I cannot do it. Despite all the time I've spent with him and the time I've spent in Kenya, I'm unable to imitate his accent, and I think it's so wonderful. It's got such a, a gentle lilt about it. Kirsten is back now saying that I can't do any other accent either. Well. I'm not going to try and argue with her at this stage of the game, you know, it's, it's clearly gone beyond a joke. I'll be in trouble. I'm just going to do as I'm told. Cecilia, yes there are, there's some very good ones and possibly some very bad ones as well. Uh, possibly the most famous zoo in Africa was the horrific menagerie that Mobuto Sesiseko, the Zairean dictator, had at his palace. And I think when they found, eventually got rid of him, he ran away and died not too long after that, of bowel cancer, I think it was. But he had a great menagerie of exotic animals that were starving and in various states of disrepair. Uh, but there are two zoological gardens in Gauteng, where I come from. Uh, that's where Johannesburg and Pretoria are. There's one in Pretoria, there's one in Johannesburg. And they, I mean, I think as far as zoos go, I think that they are very valuable, both those institutions. They do a huge amount of research into endangered species. And, you know, I believe that zoos have a place. I know that can be a little bit controversial. In that case, every single weekend, and in fact, most weekdays, there are bus loads of children from that go to the zoo to learn about animals. And without that, they will never come to a park. As parents simply don't, do not have the cash to bring them to a place like this to experience wildlife in its natural state for days on end. And so they go to the Johannesburg Zoo courtesy of the government, largely. And I think that's massively important because it will instill at least some sense of love. Oh, we're running out of signal. I will continue the story a little bit later. Sorry about that uh, signal issue with James, but we are still cruising here in the Muruwatiri River, and these lions are playing hide and seek game with us we have come all the stretch we thought there would be and not one we have seen and we can't even see their trucks having crossed the river so either they played games in us they stuck where they were or they moved back to their original position so we're just retract retracting our steps again driving back the same way we have come and slowly looking to the right side of the river where possibly they still are we haven't seen any truck as we crossed here just wondering what they're trying to do, eh? So now we're gonna go a bit slower than before, but we didn't see any track of them having crossed the river. 
which means most likely they're still on the same side they were, which would be rather unusual because from what I read in their body language, they were just crossing the river to come to this other side. All good, Craig, there with the area? All right. So keep trying and find out where they could be. It's very typical for lions or for cats to see them and you think you have them, no? Home and dry and then the next minute they are gone and sometimes gone and gone completely. You always have to be very patient and look around and that's the beauty of what kind of job or the challenge of what we do. Thinking here they are and then the one minute where did they go? And they're gone. Ha ha ha. As I'm thinking for the Swahili word for pride, I thought it was a difficult one. I'm try I was trying to look for a simple one, but I'll give you the very one that is there. And it's K-U-N-D-I. Kundi. And that's the pride of lions. Kundi la Simba. Kundi for group. And Simba as usual lion. So Kundi la Simba. That's the word for the pride of lions. Kundi la Simba. Kundila Simba, where are you? Where did you go? Unbelievable, eh? Because we have just done exactly a loop of where we thought they crossed. No trucks, not even one of them crossing the Sand River here. So we're just back tracking slowly and surely chancing to find out if they stayed on the other side. My guess is they would have just come and lay on the sand because it's much warmer, eh? But they're proving me wrong. And I agree with them, eh? But still believe we'll find out what they did. We may either go back to the very original place we were before and start a new plan from there. Okay. Nothing doing here. And this is the ex exact place I would expect them to be. None. Good friends of ours, they are also trying to look for them. We were all together and all of us have lost them. Hmm. All right, we're going to change plans here and do a different loop. And maybe they might have very quickly crossed and went to the other side. There's a water hole pretty close where we are and they might have gone there for a drink. It's possible, eh? So we not take anything for granted and assume they are where they were. No, we'll first get to the other side of Sand River and find out if they have crossed and have gone to that water hole. The only challenge is sometimes the lions move very slowly and then the next minute they may move very fast and James seems to be doing well now in terms of gremlins. No, there are no gremlins everybody, there are no technical glitches, it's just that the signal is not quite covering all of Torchwood just yet. Anyway, I'm not sure how far I got in my zoo discussion, but I think you got the gist of what I was saying. There are zoos in Africa, and I think that they play a very valuable role in research and in inspiring young minds to a love of animals. So while it might not be the most pleasant life in the world for a zoo-born a zoo-born sort of um, chimpanzee or a gorilla or a zoo-born lion. I mean, I'm, lions, I don't actually think they care. If they've got enough to eat, I think they're very content just lying about the place. But I'm, you know, wild dogs, for example. They've got wild dogs at the Johannesburg Zoo. And you know what? It's difficult. And you've seen them in the wild. It's difficult to go there and look at them and think this is... I'm sure they're fine. They're certainly not badly cared for. But obviously, 
you know, the acre or two that they have to run around in is not quite the same as here. But I tell you, without that repository of endangered genetics, it would be a problem. Angie, I agree. I agree with you completely. You say, I mean, I don't, I'm sure each, every zoo is different. But uh, you say zoos need to make more education, do more about education rather than just being about animals. I agree with you. Um, I think that the zoo's animals, however, are what attracts the people to them. So they have to have the animals. And I, I mean, Hayden Turner is a wonderful example of this. He is a highly senior, I think he actually runs the Taronga Zoo in Sydney and the amount of stuff uh, I would love to go and see that zoo but the amount of educational stuff that they do there is is phenomenal but it's the animals that pulls people there and so I think that while yes absolutely education must be a priority it is the animals that draw people towards zoos In fact, the Johannesburg Zoo is so popular that they've had to build a, an, a sort of three-story car park where the one-story one was that I used to go to as a child. And so I, I really think it's valuable. Depressing as it is to watch wild dogs in an environment like that. Yeah, and Aquaria, I guess, are... Or another one, you know, SeaWorld, of course, has had possibly the worst publicity you could imagine over the last little while. Uh, and Robert, you say you're against Aquaria. Um, I, you know, I don't know enough about them. I really don't know enough about them. There is one in Cape Town. They don't have performing animals at all. Uh, they certainly have a few endangered species there swimming around. I'm sure that just like for zoos it's not the best life but you know I think the people do their best to keep them as comfortable as possible and they play a massive massive role in education there's one in Durban as well there's a rabbit I won't worry about him and n none of them I mean in none of those places do they have orcas or um, I don't think they've got white sharks either but they've got lots of sea life that introduces again people who would never have a chance to go scuba diving or snorkeling um, or perhaps to see dive live uh, those sorts of people would find Aquaria I think extremely valuable and might inspire a love in the ocean and of course our oceans hugely under threat because the species that live in them not nearly as iconic as lions and bears and wolves and kangaroos pandas reindeer three-spotted grass mouse. Tierock, yes, I, that there I would agree. I think any, I think we've moved past the stage of thinking that performing animals in places, in anywhere, uh, circuses especially, is okay. I think we've gone past that stage. I don't think anybody, uh, right-thinking person or a rightly educated person thinks that it's okay to keep lions and elephants in circus situations. Um, so I would agree with you completely. I think circuses per se without the animals though, uh, well I just think they're great fun for kids and for adults with trapezes and clowns and jugglers and you know human beings performing in circuses I think is wonderful. Just to show the magnificence of the the way the human being is able to to move and as Kirsten rightly points out see how magnanimous I'm being she says they also have a choice yes well there we are brings the question what do you do about animals in films I mean these days most animals are computer generated so we don't have to worry too much about it but I think you think of the countless uh, blockbusters that have had live animals kept. I uh, don't know how they were kept. And trained and then used for films. I'm 
afraid I'm going to just keep on having this discussion because I can't find any... <laughs> I can't find any animals. Ah. That's fantastic. Project Alpha, you're a consultant on the new Africa exhibit at the Yorkshire Wildlife Park. That's fantastic, Project Alpha. That's good news. I think a wildlife park is slightly different from a zoo, isn't it? Isn't it? No, I guess it's not. It's not a. It's still a. It's still a zoo. But I'm pretty sure that, with the money brought to bear in the United Kingdom versus a place like uh, Burkina Faso, for example, I'm sure those animals are kept as comfortable as possible. Although. It must be very funny looking at an African animal in a British winter because I know that they do, they develop thick coats very quickly. Um, I'm sure they go inside too. But the, I saw a picture once of a Gemsbok. In fact, I saw a Gemsbok in the Denver Zoo just as it was coming out of window, winter. And it was hardly recognizable because its fur was so long. It looked like a shaggy dog with horns. No, 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 sorry, scrub hair there. Ravinda, I will do my level best to find you a last minute bush bubby. Apparently I have got five minutes five to do it. Five minutes five to find Ravinda a bush bubby. Ah, what a pity. I'll keep looking for the bush baby. The lions, I believe, have disappeared. Well, bush baby, we just saw one. And even before I stopped, it was up, down, left, gone. Lions, same. Left, right, gone. Everybody have disappeared. But I'm so happy we had that great setting earlier. So what you're looking for now are chameleons, scrub hairs, maybe an advac, maybe a pangolin, or the night people are the ones we're trying now to look for on trees. Craig tell me the last time he saw a bush baby it was like three seconds and they wondered where the eyes went. You'll always see these orange eyes looking at you and the moment you try to point your camera, you're like, it was there, but it's all gone. So we are now chanting on chameleons, scrub hairs, anything moving on the road at night. Sometimes leopards will also get more active like this time around. We have seen Shidulu after we have wrapped up the show or the drive and it could be anything or even maybe the avocas or the Birmingham boys we have those animals that get more active at night but at the moment I am more of thinking of either pangolin which I have not seen for ages advac I don't remember the last year the last time I saw an advac or the chameleon that I have only seen once on the night game drives here on the way home. I don't mind a scrub here. You know, this time around anything's better than nothing, eh? But I have been very entertained by those lions. I'm still thinking of the one sub adult male we saw earlier. And hopefully he'll pull through. I wouldn't know what might have happened to that wound and from the female that we saw, those two wounds look very identical. I'm not sure they suffered the same way, but those two wounds look very identical. Eh? But if the female has made it, I'm sure it will. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, you're right, Cassie, it's a shame. But uh, let's see how much luck James has with the bush baby. None. None luck with the bush baby. Zero. Nada. Zilch. Apparently we have two minutes to find a bush baby. I can find a scrub hair, Ravinda. Is that no good? No? 
Yeah. You find your wildebeest. No, it's not good. Our Lorem were people do James Hendry accents all the time. They constantly take me off. They think I sound English. People who are not English think I sound English. No English person thinks I sound vaguely English at all. So I'm just going to have to turn off the lights here because the wildebeestens are getting themselves into a wild panic. Ooh. No, 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 never mind. So everybody's always trying to pretend that, with my accent that I'm English, which I'm not. Oh, they say. I don't think I sound like that at all. Yes, moon for the credits, good idea. There we go, everybody, you don't have to look at me again. All right, Kirsten, um, I think you can roll credits in exactly five, four, three, two, one. Roll credits. You see how clever I was there, everybody. I told Kirsten what she, to do, and she had to do it. She only did it because I told her to. And now she can't do anything about it. Right, that's the end of our show. What a wonderful afternoon it has been, and a wonderful morning. We will see you tomorrow, of course, at 6.30am. Until then, stay safe and happy. Bye-bye.